All right, everybody. So today, back on the podcast, we have a fan favorite, Lyle McDonald. How you doing, man? How do you doing? Well, I was looking, and I, I think you actually might be my most frequent guest at this point. I think cool. this is like the seventh or eighth time you've been on. So, all right, well, good deal. So, also, guess what? Today is actually my birthday. So that oh, just shows right. you how much I value Lyle McDonald's uh, time. <laughs> this well, is what I do on my birthday. I, I would, had I not received yet another Facebook slap, I would have uh, pointed out that today you are the birthday princess. Oh, and that yeah. means that cake calories don't count. And trust me, I'm an expert. Uh, oh, this is go. scientifically validated. So have an extra piece for me. There you go. We'll do. What I tell everybody on their birthday. So, uh, you know, there's a lot that we can cover uh, right before starting recording. You said there's been the Mike Gizertel drama. And uh, obviously, we will, we will touch on that. But it's right. is I've now had so I just had if you know, Jeffrey Verity Schofield, um, he more recently, at least as far as I'm aware, more recently has kind of come into it. And he made a video on you and uh, Mike. Okay. And he basically talked about this whole failure thing. And he said, you right. know, he said, basically, he's a big fan of Mike. Uh, and an RP, but just objectively in this situation, he's wrong and that Lyle is right. Correct. And that I have to say is a sentiment that I've seen numerous people have DM'd me about it. Numerous people have commented on my video about that. And it kind of seems yep. the same sentiment of like, look, like Lyle's kind of a jerk, <laughs> but he's right. And I, I did come to a similar conclusion watching the video that it was kind of interesting because like, look, like, and, and I totally understand. Like, of course, ideally, we'd have a round table here of you and Mike, and we'd all get along and be able to discuss it. But, uh -huh. um, and I always say this anytime I talk about anybody, like, you know, I, I've met Mike, I, I like him. But on this topic, when I see their sets, it is kind of hard to <laughs> say, like, you are going to failure, especially when you, in his example, you know, he did this example on a, basically like a hack squat type of machine. And he said, okay, this is like, basically one or zero RAR and he got 10 and then he did a set to like 15 as like his like crazy hyped up RAR. I was like, but how, how was 10 zero RAR if you got 15 and some people even argued even that 15th rep didn't really seem like you couldn't have busted out another one. So it's just sure. interesting. And I don't know if it's a, a cognitive dissonance. There's that quote, what is it like somebody, it's hard to understand something when you're, I think that it's actually like when your income is based on not understanding it, but you could apply it to, you know, a lot of different things. And uh, I guess that's just, it's just a little interesting. Uh, oh, I don't, oh, I don't think it's cognitive dissonance at all. I don't, but before I come back to that, just cause I think it's funny. Yeah, go for it. I read a paper or an article yesterday. Apparently the Donning-Kruger effect, mm -hmm. they don't think it's real. And there's been some statistical reanalysis of that paper and they think it was a random occurrence. And what that means is that the people who wrote the paper on the Donning-Kruger effect are suffering from it. Come on, that's, <laughs> that's grade A comedy. No, it, which just kind of goes to your point. Okay, I don't think this is cognitive dissonance at all. Now, I'm, I, I generally don't, you know, tr even people that I disagree with, which is pretty much everybody, including myself some days, like make yeah. no mistake. Um, Mike is not dumb, okay? Now, I think he's intellectually dishonest, but he's not dumb, and these are very different things. Deep down, he knows I'm right. He knows what the research says. Everybody in this industry knows what the research says, and they all know that reps and reserve is not a subjective definition. Now, Mike played some verbal games with real world failure and there's this failure and that failure. And that was my fault for giving him that out. Because mm -hmm. what Mike is best at is talking in circles. He is a politician. Go listen to any five podcasts he does on the same topic. He will say whatever is correct at the time to make him right. He has no consistency in his arguments. Go watch the debate between he and I on the volume thing. He contradicts himself from the first half to the second half, okay? Mike knows I'm right. He doesn't like that, A, he got called out, but most importantly, that he got called out by me. Because I decided, I realized last week, I had a superpower. And that is, I can turn big, strong, muscular men into bawling babies with words on a screen. Because that's all this, Mike, Mike has read the research, 
And if anyone else in that circle jerk, by which I mean Brad Schoenfeld, Eric Helms, Zordos, Krieger, Greg Knuckles, had any guts, Helms has done research on this. They know I'm right. But to speak out against Mike would A, mean he's involved in their money making, but B, saying Long McDonald is right. And that's unacceptable. Jeff Nipper did a video doing, saying the exact same thing I did, going, this is what zero reps reserve looked like. And his rep speed doubled or tripled. He goes, now I'm not saying you should train this hard. What I'm saying is this is what it looks like. And if you don't know what it looks like, you can't set the exact same thing I've been saying. Now, did he have the guts to say Mike Isratel is wrong? No, because they work together and they make money together. Mike knows I'm right, but he is so deep down this hole of defense, of not being willing to admit that A, he's wrong, but especially that I'm right, because nobody in this industry can do that, right? Because I mean that I don't think it's cognitive dissonance at all. He got called out. And now being a good little guru who knows that his little followers will not believe in him if he admits wrongdoing and being the type of insecure little boy that thinks that never admitting you're wrong is the sign of strength. It's not so you grow up, right? I look back when I was in my 20s and I did that too. When you grow up, you realize that admitting you're wrong is what men do. He knows I'm right. And I've seen several other people go, yeah, Lyle's an asshole, but he's right. Mike's most recent thing that I saw, he got, there's this guy, the lifting dermatologist. Did you follow this? I, I saw the one video. Okay, now, he was in my group. He put up a video going to zero reps to reserve. He knows I'm right. Go to his wall. He's got all this positive stuff about me. And I'm sure Mike approached him and said, I want to spend 90 minutes character assassinating Lyle and Greg Doucette. So ask me a question that's never been on the table. Who do you want as the coach? Oh, I so that I could well. spend 90 minutes fucking lying about both of them. Because one of Mike's things this whole time and it is a lie. And by lie, I mean consciously, deliberately telling him this truth, right? Like it's one thing to be mistaken about someone is saying, right? That is not a lie when you are incorrect. When you knowingly say something that's not true, that's a lie. And he's been saying all along, Lyle's advocating failure. No, I'm not. I've said five or six times in my videos, hey, I'm not saying you should train to this level of intensity. Right. All I'm saying is that until you have for a while, you don't know what it is. But he continues to repeat this, knowing that it's not true, so that he can then argue against the straw man that only he's created. He know, he this is not cognitive dissonance. He and knows he's like, right, but he's too gutless to admit it. In my definitionally, opinion. it's because part of me, like when I was talking to some people, I was like, you know, like, okay, but since we don't need to train to failure for results, like, doesn't matter that much. But it, it does matter it does in matter. the sense that, like, all of these recommendations for how hard to train, um, especially if you're using reps and reserve, obviously, then that's pretty relevant, right? And, and like when we look at volume studies and everything showing higher volume, if they're saying they went to failure and they were actually three uh, three reps away sure. from failure, that, that it really does matter. I mean, you know, as somebody who has just like crushed themselves in the gym, there's just no way I could do, you know, obviously the classic like Schoenfeld study showing 45 sure. steps or whatever. And yeah, that's not- show me me you know crapping on on uh schoenfeld at all i'm just saying like correct yeah that matters in you know because as i've joked before um you know i've done research studies and by that i mean i have been like co-author on two papers in college and it was like some nonsense but the point right. is like whatever yes yeah you, yeah you but do science exactly and uh but like when we had to do uh, some squatting like i was like teaching these other students like how to squat and like they were going to failure but it's just it's very different. And um, sometimes what happens in training studies, I think, is not what you would think if you're like a serious sure. lifter. It's, it's not exactly what you would depict yourself doing. Well, and I think here it's probably worth making sort of a terminological difference. And again, this is my mistake. By using the word muscular failure, it gave him the opportunity to talk in circles because he did this video about, well, this is what real world failure is. And what he even said at one point was, this is me failing by not doing the final three grindy reps I could do. By definition, you just said this isn't true muscular failure, right? You are, what, what you were saying is you are choosing to stop, right? Now, that is often called a self-determined RM or a voluntary RM. There is technical failure. And look, if you go back and read my original tedious article series, I addressed all of this. I said, yeah, there is a technical component that can cause 
technical breakdown. That becomes a definitional thing. But I was extremely specific in my definition from day, because I am, I like to be very linguistically specific. Mike likes to be very linguistically vague because that way he can just keep talking in circles and that's what he's best at. And I said, my operational definition is, of muscular failure is an inability to complete another rep, another full range repetition despite the provision of maximal effort. Okay, so all that real world failure nonsense, all that redefinition of muscular failure, that was him arguing against something I was never saying, right? Because that's the, in every video I put up, I put up what? Two or three dozen, including some of Dorian Rates, some great lifters. That final repetition may triple in duration from rep one. Every single video, some of mine went from one second to seven. And I would not have completed the rep, right? Now, that is. But again, the failure, it's a really tedious review paper I've got somewhere that looks at the 27 different definitions of failure over the last century, right? There are, right, some have even said, oh, and he did this, he's like, oh, I was, I was choosing a velocity cap. That's just after the fact bullshit. Mm -hmm. He's been changing his argument the entire time. Just go watch the series of videos. He doesn't make the same argument twice. In that lifting dermatology video, I mean, it, it became clear that it, it started to become pretty personal, right? Obviously. And um, sure. he was saying stuff about, you know, if, if he showed up at your house, the difference of how you would act. And he said, you had used anabolics, but they didn't work and things like that. I'd love to know where he got that idea. I'd yeah, love to I, know how he, it, it's because, like I said, it's like politics. This is the equivalent of you, him going on some puff piece thing to spread lies about. And even if it were true, and no genuine question what is because i mean online have to do with fucking anything this is lane norton lyle made my wife cry. this is eric helms i blocked lyle because he was sending me abusive emails these are grown men and they're a bunch of pansies oh no i was mean to you online grow the fuck up you children i'm sorry that is pathetic it is pitiful for a 37 year old man and and does that actually invalidate my criticism in any form or fashion. No, it doesn't. But he won't go look. He has never addressed the actual direct criticism. He has made all these, just like all the other gurus. When I called out Brand Show Advelt for not blinding, oh, you can trust me. That's not science, dude. Do not pretend you're evidence-based when you ignore the science. And that's what they all do. And Mike is butt hurt because I'm right. Now I want to read something because I brought yeah, right, it. because RP pretends to be science-based. Bunch of PhDs, bunch of evidence-based people. So does Mike. Here was another little. So I pulled a, a clip of Mike and he said, oh yeah, you know, all these people in the gym want to follow the big drugged up juice bro. Well, in that case, you go to the research. If the research says he's wrong, the research beats his physique. Okay, I've got the research. But then he said, you should only take advice from people based on their physique, which isn't Mike. And then even though Greg Doucette been a great, better pro body. He goal. said you should only take advice from people based on their physique and who they've coached. Hmm. Who the fuck is Mike coached? Nobody. Mike is a mediocre bodybuilder at best. He he wants it both ways. He change like I said, he's a politician. He will change his argument based on what he needs to say to never be wrong, but he will never be consistent because does evidence beat the bro? Does the bro card beat the evidence? It depends on whether or not the evidence says he's right. If this, if he had the science to say he was correct, that's all he would be talking about. If Lane had had the science to say metabolic damage was correct, that's all he would have talked about to me. Instead, we got Lyle's mean, Lyle's bipolar, Lyle made my wife cry. It's the guru playbook. Then, so Greg Doucette has a pro card, has set powerlifting world records, or national, or has a powerlifting record, which might, that's genetics. Okay, so your results are your training, but Greg's is genetics. But then, so science beats the big bro in the gym, but you should base who you believe, take advice from based on how big they are. But even though Greg is a more successful bodybuilder, he's still wrong. It's almost like Mike's entire argument is I'm right and I'll say whatever it takes because that's all it is. There is no consistency. Now, back to Renaissance periodization. In one of their endless templates, their male physique template, it comes with an FAQ talk because they base their stuff on reps and reserve. And I actually want to come back to the definitional thing. Here's what they wrote in their FAQ. Typically three reps from fail 
right? So that's two reps in reserve, actually, right? If you're three from failure, you're two reps in reserve. Does that make sense? Yeah. We'll see a significant slowdown in bar speed towards the end of the set, but is not usually perceived as very difficult. Two from fail, which is one reps in reserve, is where straining and shaking may occur and is going to feel very tough. One from fail, which is zero reps in reserve, right? You'd fail on the next rep, is very close to all you have to give and is going to feel like a near maximal effort. That is in the Renaissance periodization FAQ for their template. Nothing Mike has shown looks like that. His own company's information that he makes money off of says he's wrong. This is not cognitive distance, dude. This is I'd like to see him just have a, a, you know, he chose a hack squat, which is tough because it's probably not, and like not even one that as far as I could see on it had like supports. It would be good to just see him use one and, and actually fail. So there's no guess of sure. could you have done another one? You just get stuck at the bottom and see it. I, from the beginning, that's what I've said. I said, look, and this is, I've been arguing with people for 25 years. This is my career. I've just been very successful at it. I always tell people exactly how to prove me wrong. And I don't ever change it. I don't shift goalposts. I tell them every time, look, if you want to prove me wrong, if you want me to shut up, because they all want me to shut up, but none of them will actually take my challenge. Here's what you need to do. If you want to prove to me that the Schoenfeld five sets of squats to failure in 90 seconds or the Brigado study, which is even more absurd, can be done. Do it and send me the video. Never got one. Okay. It's real simple. They always expect me to step up to their challenges. Mike challenged me to debate that thing. And I, oh, if you don't, you're a pansy. Okay. I did it. I wasted 90 minutes of my life, but I did it. They make excuses. It's funny. If I were to do that, I, I'm a chicken shit. But what have I said from the get go? I said, Mike, if you want to prove me wrong, get on a leg press something you can do safely. And this went out to all those little followers that trolled my comments in my videos. Gay jokes, real mature, real. I, I understand why they follow Mike. He's a 14 year old being macho to other 14 year olds. I get it. I get why they like him. But he's like, yep, I F'd Greg Doucette in the A. Science, okay. So I said, look, get on something you can do safely. Machine chest press, leg press, leg extension. Do rep after rep after rep. So you are unable to complete a repetition. Send me the video and show me what it looks like. It's that simple. It, should, it would have taken three minutes to do that versus the hours he has put into making excuses and all of his little followers. Send me the video. It's real easy. And yet all they make is excuses because he knows factually that if he actually did that, if he actually did a video truly to that point, it would prove me right. So he's going to dodge it and attack me with the two-faced lifting dermatologist and redefine failure and all this other nonsense and ignore what his own company says. So are you mad? He at knows I'm right. The, uh, the lifting dermatologist. I don't follow. I mean, I've heard of him. I've seen him. Um, Fuck that. Was that because he had Mike on or did he say something specific? No, it's because he was in my group kissing up to me, mm. playing nice, until he had that opportunity. And I don't like two-faced shit bags like that. I don't know who he is. I don't care who he is. I don't have any real dog in the fight with Greg Doucette. I know he yells a lot in his videos. Right. That's, that's really where it starts and stops for me with him. I have no dog in that fight other than he's somehow involved in this. Yeah. No, I don't like, like two-faced people. I don't like people who sit in my group so they can whatever pull, you know, spy on me and then go turn on. That I don't, that's what, I don't know him. I don't give three-fifths mm. of a damn about him. I want to go back real quick. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Definitionally. So muscular mm. failure, even though I was very clear in my definition, I will agree you can have different definitions of it. Technical failure. One researcher said if you define a specific rep speed target, then failure is an inability to maintain that rep speed. And that might have some validity and velocity-based training when you're training for power, right? That would be like, okay, if my goal is a two-second up, four-second down, and I can't maintain that two-second up pace, that's failure. And in a sense, it is. But again, I was very specific in how I defined failure. And there was a reason I was very specific, because I think that's the only... Because... This was never about how to train, which is the other game Mike played. Oh, Mike, maybe Lyle should come coach me. 
Um, I never said I could, should, or wanted to coach you ever. And I've said several times, I don't want to coach. It was never about how he trained. And maybe he did see it as a personal criticism. I don't care how he trains. When you're on as many drugs as he is, it doesn't matter how you train. He can go fat. And I even said flat out, it's probably safer and healthier when you're on drugs. He didn't get hurt. Mm-hmm. It was never about how he trained. So it's only about who you take advice from. I never gave advice. I was pointing out a discrepancy in the information he was providing. So fine, we can get into quibbles. However, what zero reps and reserve is, is not, subjective. Zordos in his original 2016 paper defined it when they described it to people, inability to complete the next repetition. That's it. I think um, there is no debate over that. There is no debate. And then there's endless work on bar speed. And what happens as you approach that bar speed drops, mean propulsive velocity, whatever you want to measure goes down. There is no debate on this and nothing Mike has demonstrated, including the videos that I picked out initially of this guy doing a bench press warm up set. That's zero reps reserve. No, it's not. He never slowed down, he quit. He stopped. None of your, none of, nothing Mike has shown. has shown a bar speed drop whatsoever. I think when it comes to reserve. the, um, the whole like, you know, what drugs people are using and whatnot, this is not to Mike specifically. This is literally anybody who did not wait like 20 years to use. Um, if you know Pete Rubish, if you remember him at all, so he was a no. pretty popular powerlifter. But anyway, we were talking about this and, and he agreed because he he started at like 20, he came off at 29 and he was like, man, like it's so different training naturally. Oh. But what I said and he agreed with is like, unless you actually waited until you like hit your natural peak and then did that for like another like five years where you realize like, oh wow, like nothing is happening what I think happens when you introduce anabolics is like, okay, so like you're kind of making that natural progress. Most people, a lot of times it's after five to eight years that they start to do it. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they continue to make some progress. Even if they never took anything crazy, they continue to make that progress. And in their mind, these new things that they're trying, whether it's, you know, whatever unique exercises, whatever unique method, it's like, Oh, well, I've been progressing all this time. It's like, well, yeah, but you've had, this added dose the whole time that's just making it seem like whatever you're doing is working and then one other point on top of that is like somebody you know sometimes i hear people say oh but i know it's working specifically even though i'm on a lower i mean because i'm on a lower dose so they'll say i'm bigger than i was but i'm on a lower dose therefore it must be superior training and my argument to that is like look if you were in a 2000 calorie surplus, something just egregious, and you brought it down to a thousand calorie surplus, you could still get bigger and bigger. You're in this surplus. If, yeah, maybe you were taking a ridiculous amount of drugs before, but you're maybe you've dropped it down. You still have anabolics that maybe haven't maximized their own level for you. Sure. So um, I just think it, it always muddies the water, whether the person's completely intellectually honest or not, it, it always muddies the water. Well, and make no mistake, I don't want to get into that. Like, I don't care. I don't care that pro bodybuilders take drugs. I don't care that Mike takes drugs. I don't care that his training partner takes drugs. I don't give a shit how they train. I don't. I don't care about, it, who, about how anybody trains if I'm not their coach. I never criticized Mike's training. People can go back and look at exactly what I said. And even after he brought that up, I said, I don't care how you train, Mike. Clearly it's working for you guys in as much as anything works. Mm-hmm. I don't care. And I, and I even flat out said, it's probably healthier in the long run. Dorian was hurt a lot because high intensity, eventually you break when you're on all, you know, it was never about his training. I don't care if people are on drugs. It probably is a better way to train, but that's not the point. The point is he is telling people that's zero reps and reserve and it's operationally not. That was it. And that's the only argument or the only discussion worth even having. And that's the one thing he will not address. Well, I'm not saying that's that's everything around it. You You make it about 10 other things, including, well, if I showed up at Lyle's door, dude, come to my gym and let me take you through a set. And well, I'll, I'll drop anybody in two sets of 15 in the back squat to true failure. Right. Yeah. I know that's that's not, you're not criticizing how he's training. I'm saying anytime yeah. I think you, you just have to consider that like it, like it just does change it. But no, I, I agree. I, I think people should not be training like to failure all the time. No. And I never have said they should. All right. I said was, well, there were two things or well, maybe three things. I said, one, 
This is what zero reps reserve is. And by every definition, every study, <laughs> everything that looks at velocity-based training, one group identified that, let's see, at zero reps in reserve, I think squat dropped by 20% and bench by 40%, the bar speed. Maybe I might have those reversed. Every, another one that was looking at velocity-based training, same group, because uh, I just looked at the literature last night, said uh, that initial, like, pretty much if you saw like a 10% drop in mean propulsive velocity, that was about half as many reps as you could do limits, right? Okay. Mike shows zero bar speed drop. He's not even within 50% of zero reps in reserve, no matter how, no matter how hard he wants to look, no matter how, how many times he wants to fake dry heave in a bucket, which Jesus Christ, is this where we're at now? Really? Really? This is really what we're doing to impress a bunch of 14 year olds. It's pretending to yak to show how hard you're training. Take my challenge, three minutes, prove me wrong. It's just that simple. And anyone can do it and send me the video and I will time analyze it. And none, you know, and I had I had to just call people names to get anybody to send me videos, and they all showed the same thing. Every single one was zero exceptions, as they approached zero reps in reserve or the inability to complete another repetition. Bar speed dropped sometimes staggeringly. Like it depends. There's there's variance, but if you take it to that point, bar speed drops. This is not, and that was a, so that was my point. Was what you are telling people is zero reps in reserve is not. That is right. not even debatable, right? Because there are people like, well, who's right, Mike or Lyle? There is no who's right. There is what the science flat out says, and there is no study that contradicts me. There's not one. There's another one by Izquierdo from 2006 that I find really interesting. They tested bar speed at one RM, right? A one rep max, I think squat and bench press. They always use squat and bench, and I actually do wish they would test a machine because I think they might even see right. a difference there because you're not dealing with technical breakdown yep. or fear. But what they then did is they tested as many reps as they could do from like 65 to 85%. And what they saw was that A, the bar speed on the final repetition, regardless of the number of reps, was essentially the same. But even more interestingly, the bar speed on the final set of all those submaximal sets was the same as the 1RM. Because the final rep, zero reps in reserve, the final rep before you can, before you're unable to complete one, it's a maximal effort. It is a one RM, but on every single one of them, bar speed dropped enormously. So that was my main point is this is, is it, so that was that. It was then that, no, I'm not saying you should train to this level. However, until you've trained to this level, you cannot do a workout and say you're at two reps in reserve, which all the runners on periodization things do. Go look at their hypertrophy book. They talk about training one, two, three, four, five reps in reserve. Well, if you think a warm up set is five reps, is zero reps in reserve, and you're five reps below that, you are doing repeat warm up sets. So, regarding everything the that I parallel. actually said, he misrepresented completely because that's all he could do because the facts were just like Mike, just like Lane did, just like all the gurus have. Because when they don't have the facts, suddenly evidence and science and research is no longer relevant. It's only as, relevant when it says they're right. As far as the parallel between the one rep max, because I, I think anytime I've ever seen, certainly myself, but others like truly go to like a rep max like failure, then mm-hmm. yes, it slows True. down. You do yeah. see sometimes with like, you know, in parallel between one rep maxes, somebody will do in you know, like their third attempt and it will go up maybe faster than one would expect. It's like, oh, damn. And sometimes it's just like, oh, they could have clearly added more. Some people I've seen argue, oh, that's just, you know, muscle fibers, whatever, that as much as it went up easily, if they added five more pounds, they legitimately would have failed. Do you think there's any parallel there going backwards? I mean, I mean, possibly, but it's interesting to me that, I mean, yes. Have I seen that? Sure. And I think, this could get into a number of different things. And uh, Tib tried to defend Mike's crap with that. Oh, it's fiber typing and fast twitch fail differently. And yet somehow in none of the half a dozen studies that have been done on this, have they found that person? Mm -hmm. So either every single study is happening to get slow. I think what's happening there is 
any kind, and this is why I think squat and bench press can be problematic compared to a machine, right? It's a Louis Simmons thing. A lift doesn't fail, a muscle fails. And if that extra five pounds overwhelms a little muscle, it's just right over the threshold for whatever your weak point is. Then yeah, maybe it's because I looked and there's some top power lifters that yeah, their, their, their third attempt is generally, it's relatively fast. It's, it may not be a super grinder. It doesn't go mm -hmm. up quickly, generally speaking, compared to sub maximal set. So yeah, but so what? So now we're going to use the 1% of elite power lifters. Cause again, and you can go to any other meet and you will see people grind and grind and grind. So either there is this magical physiological difference and everyone in every study, and apparently the three dozen people who sent me videos, and I've got more, I didn't bother running because I got bored. Apparently they're all slow twitch. It's magic. It's magic that not a single video I've gotten sent of my, not a single research paper has found this magic person. So I think in powerlifting, you are looking at some oddities that could be nervous. Of, like, yeah, I don't disagree with that. But we're not necessarily talking about one or, I mean, yeah, I realize I just made that comparison. Yeah. But. I was curious. Yeah. And, and again, and there was, and there was variety, make no mistake. In his Kyoto paper, make no mistake. There is variability in how much bar speed drops, but it does for everybody to yeah. a relatively greater or lesser degree. So yeah, but again, fantastic. Get on a leg press. Like I said, take the technical aspect out of it. Take the, you know, we could get way up our own rear ends about, whatever, Golgi, whatever. Hatfield used to talk about the Golgi tendon organ and how you had to mm -hmm. detrain that and nervous inhibition and all this other nonsense. And great, fantastic, don't care. Get on a leg press, get on a leg extension, get on a hammer chest press and rep it out until it won't move and send me the video and we'll see exactly what happens to bar speed. Because I know what will happen. And I think, like I said, no, you shouldn't necessarily, but even with that, because I think another thing he talks, he's talked about, and, and the RP Hypertrophy book talks about this. And I got, I was saying this years ago, I was saying this before Mike was even in the weight room, because I've been around forever. Wasn't there another one of his criticisms that I'm old, and therefore I'm out of touch somehow? Um, I did hear him say that one of the reasons that you're defensive is because once upon a time you were the science guy, and now... I'm defensive? I believe that's that in the lifting dermatologist video, that's what he said, that like, you don't like that you're, that there's all these other science guys now and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Which again, another beautiful personal attack. Yeah. Bring science or shut the fuck up, guys. They're all the same. Isn't it like they must get a book. They must get a playbook for how to make completely irrelevant arguments. This is what science says. I don't look, I created the evidence-based fit, online fitness community. I Am I, am I jealous? No, I don't give three-fifths of a shit. I find it funny that they've become what, what they originally hated. Originally, they wanted to bring science. And now anecdotes suddenly count. This bullshit counts when they're wrong. Non-scientific. Evidence only counts for them when it says they're right. That's not evidence-based. They're just a guru like Gary Tobbs. And he even at least he brought bullshit science. He played the same guru games as they do, but he at least used, he, he at least dredged out irrelevant science. They dredge out crap like, fuck you, Lyle. That was one of Mike's earliest responses to me. Very eloquent, very erudite, very, because I could say the same thing to Mike. Mike's like, well, if I showed up at Lyle's house. Okay, and I did say that. Mike, why won't you use arguments like this in scientific journals? Hmm. Why the difference? Yeah, I mean online. I'm sorry that I hurt your little feelings. You play science when it suits you. And just like all these guys, either play, either bring me science or don't pretend you're, you're just another big dumb bro. But anyway, so no. But okay, so yes. So I get what I was saying was, well, as far as the old thing, Mike's special sports, sports supplements coach is just as old as I am. It's got lights people that are in this field. It's just a dismissal. It's just bullshit. And they know what makes it even worse is they know that the dum-dums listening to them will go, yeah, Lyle's just defensive. It's not an argument. It's not science. It's not evidence. It's pandering to the cretins that watch your videos. And the fact that he knows that'll work. Again, it's just like politics. People know that if they go tell lies about the other team's guy, their people will believe them uncritically. 
even if it's just nothing but an ad hominem. That makes it that much worse. They only do it when they don't have facts. Is and yes, there... the HIT guys, because they went to such deep failure, absolutely generated a lot of fatigue and it frequently hurt their training frequency. And they found that when they stopped a couple reps shy of that, that they could train more frequently. I was saying that back in the 2000s. So I don't disagree, but it was never about how to train, ever. This was never about how someone should train. And I said that so many times, ever. This is not about me giving advice. It's never telling anybody how to train. It's me saying that if you don't know what zero reps for reserve is, you cannot anchor three reps in reserve to anything. You cannot anchor 20% below what anything without knowing what maximum is. You can't. But I then find it interesting, dog crap, Dante Trudell's system based around failure, because any actual coach knows that fatigue management is always about volume, frequency, and intensity. Dante goes maximum intensity, but low volume and a moderate frequency. Yeah, if you want to do 20 sets, you absolutely can't train like that. And I Have you done DC training in a while? What's that? Have you done DC training? I've done rest pause. I mean, to, you know, I trust me, I've done it all over, over the years. Sure. I did old school hard gainer training where I pushed for into a 10 second isometric. That's why I know where that exists. Cause mm -hmm. I trained like that for years. And no, I'm not saying you should or shouldn't. That was never the point. Do you think Dante, seem, anything... Dante seems to make some monsters because it's all, yes, fatigue management yeah. is about the interaction. So for Mike to go, well, you don't want to do those last three reps because they generate too much fatigue. Well, that depends. To say that, yeah, if you want to train three times a week, you can't do that, the same muscle group. If you want to train 10 sets in a workout, you certainly can't do that. Dante's produced bodybuilders that are a whole lot more successful than Mike. So I'd love to hear Mike dismiss that. Do you, well, I guess two things there. One, just as like a little side thing, um, I, I never personally found the weighted stretches did anything for me other than yeah. torture me. Uh, yeah. Do you have, I feel like they do anything? I believe that they are because I know I know Dante was getting into you know some of that the, the silly stretch literature on quails mm -hmm. and all that other nonsense. Um, I always saw them as a maximally centric repetition more than anything. Mm -hmm. I think that if they had any benefit, it was increasing the volume a little bit in the max. I don't, I'm not convinced that that loaded stretching has yeah. the effect that he claims. I don't think the mechanism that he, he was arguing, and I don't know what he argues now. I know the most Come recent on. thing I saw him, write. Somebody asked him about it and he was like, I don't even want to talk about that. He's like, I am so over talking about this because yeah. he's been pushing it for, you know, time for 20 years. Yeah. No, I don't. But I think if you look at the system and what, you know, this is one of the things he said that I thought was very intelligent. His goal was to generate the maximal stimulus with the minimal volume in an attempt to get the biggest skew between basically stimulus and fatigue or training volume. Now, dog crap burned a lot of people out. Yeah. It worked well for a lot of people. And again, I don't want anybody to hear me saying that you should or should not train dog crap. And I'm going to keep repeating that because I get tired of people misrepresenting what I'm saying. And if I don't say it 12 times, apparently they can't yeah. get it. Yeah. <laughs> Not saying you should or shouldn't train like that. But my point is that if you're going to go, oh, training too deep into failure or going to complete limit failure generates too much fatigue, well, I would say you don't know. Again, it's all about the interaction. Fatigue management is all about volume, frequency, intensity. So yeah, if you want to do 20 sets in the weight room and pump it up, yeah, you got to make them all warm-up sets, right? And I will even maintain, and it's funny, I've enjoyed watching the entire evidence-based crew walk back the volume thing over the last couple of years. None of them have the guts to come out and say I was right all along. I was, but none of them would ever admit that. James Creek, because one of the things I said, I go, look, it is, in, it is humanly impossible to do five by eight to 12 on a 90 second rest to failure in the squat, followed by leg press, followed by leg extension. It is, and if you, anybody listening to this, if you disagree with me, send me the video. I love to be proven wrong, despite people's belief to the contrary. I love to be proven wrong. 
telling you exactly how to do it. Videos at bodyrecomposition.com. Prove me wrong. And I will publicly say I was wrong. And I won't hold my breath because nobody sent me that video in three years. But same thing with Mike's study with um, Cody Hahn. Yes. Hahn, yes. For the longest time I pronounced it Juan and I feel really bad about that. <laughs> um, I don't want to be Cody that guy, Hahn. Cody Hahn and Dr. Roberts, where they did, you know, 32 sets, but they were four reps in reserve. It's a series of warm-ups on a 10-minute rest. And what I said a couple years ago, I said, yeah, you know what? The reason in those studies, the higher volume works better is because when every set is so ineffectual, you have to do a ton of volume to make up for it. And I think we can put that in the effective reps model. And I'm not saying this model is right. I want to see more research. I think it's the best model we have right now, but I'm not saying that I do think I want to see the, the literature, right? If let's say, uh, Chris. Barricade. His last name? Yeah, Chris Beardley. Oh, okay. He's written mo more about this than I think any human being. Let's say that, just for the sake of example, that 25 effective reps per workout is the maximum. Just for sake of example. Well, if I do five sets of eight to failure, I've gotten those 25 reps. Right? The last five reps will basically be effective reps. Sure. Well, if I'm doing a set that's only got one rep, one effective rep, or say two effective reps per set, because it's so far from failure, I got to do 12 sets. Boom, suddenly, suddenly the model comes together. Suddenly we can, and so what James Krieger wrote. Now what's funny in his volume Bible, he wrote, well, per workout, 10 sets per workout is probably the maximum number of useful sets you can do. Huh, really? And yet you defended Brad's 15 set per workout study for a year. Interesting. And six was the minimum and I don't, whatever, neither here nor there. But what he wrote, he said, I think, I think we can explain why the higher volume studies, what the difference is between the Ostrowski and the other studies. It's because the short rest interval made the training lower quality. Wow. Wow. That's what I said two years ago. You have to do a lot of volume when every set is useless or relatively useless. But again, that's the volume intensity frequency thing. Yeah, if you wanna to go to true failure, you got maybe four, four sets in you or two of Dante's horror sets, Yeah. right? If you wanna do, if you wanna train at four reps in reserve where every set gives you, let's be nice and say one to two effective reps, you're gonna need 12 to 20 sets, yeah. the end. And that's fine. And I'm not saying one is better mm -hmm. than the other. But what I'm saying is if you don't know what zero reps reserve is, you don't know any of this. I do a lot of rest pause training, actually, um, basically like DC sets, but I do a total of like six to eight work sets per week. So um, yeah, and, and that's just it. I, I think even if you sat down and worked it out, like, and, and I think it was actually, well, Dante, Dante's system existed first, but I think Blade, Borge, Fagerly. It's weird. He was on my forum Berger. for years and I yeah. don't know how to pronounce his name because I'm dumb American. Um, he was, I think, one of the first ones when he came with his Maya rep system and talking about effective reps from memory. And he put more of a, I think, a physiological uh, basis to it. Yeah. And his was, you know, okay, you do your activation set where you basically go to, Dante goes to failure, I think, my reps goes to a speed drop, which there again, our I'm not as familiar with my reps. Uh, it's they're they're similar enough that it doesn't really matter. But the idea is that okay, you've now gotten full activation of the muscles, right? Because what effective reps the model says is that that the key hypertrophy reps are the ones done under the state of full muscular fiber recruitment, and you can get that by going heavy. 80, 85% of max, you'll get full recruitment essentially from rep one. You can go light and doing more reps, right? By the final four or five of a set of 15, which again is why the velocity drops look the same because we're looking at identical physiology at the tail end, that those are the key hypertrophy reps. So myo reps and Dante, the idea is first you achieve full recruitment, but then the rest pause sets because there's not full recovery 
are being done under the condition of main, uh, that you're maintaining full recruitment. So the idea is, okay, so let's say you're doing a set of eight and it's got three effective reps. Just again, sake of example, do the set of eight that you could do 10 with. To get, say, 12 effective repetitions, you'd have to do four sets, right? Three effective reps per set, four sets, 12 effective reps. The Myo reps idea is, okay, we've gotten, say, three effective reps on the first set because we went to activation. Then you rest 10 or 15 seconds. Then you get three or four more, but those are effective reps. Rather than doing the first five, again, to get to the three key ones, you just do them right there. So now you've got six to seven effective reps. Then you get another two to three that are still effective reps. Then you get the final one. So in that one continuous set, you've gotten the same number of effective reps as doing four sets. And that's what he's basically said. I believe- Instead of doing four straight sets, you're saying. Correct. Rather than doing yes. four sets of eight with a full rest, two minute rest period, you right. do the one long set. And I believe what he said, and again, I haven't looked at, at stuff in a lot of years, was that one Maya rep set is the equivalent of three to four straight sets. Do not swear me to that. Yeah. Right. It could be two to three, but the, the conceptual point is that that one extended set and Dante dog crap would be the same thing. Right. You could do eight straight sets of an exercise, or you could do two of Dante's grinder rest pause sets. And those two rest pause sets I are call, the equivalent of eight straight sets. Yeah, I call Dante. So like if I do a set of like bicep curls, right? And so the way Dante would say it'd be like, you know, 22 or to 25 RP, right? So maybe that is whatever, 13, six, and then three. Yeah. Um, I would count that as three sets because he talks sure. about 15 breaths between them. 15 breaths is a little like, longer. Yeah, that's like 40 seconds. So yeah. that to me is three sets. And, but like I said, that to me, I like it because I'm used to pushing very hard and yes. it's very time efficient. Absolutely. Um, so, and I've never noticed any, I've certainly not noticed worse results. I don't think it's anything magical, but it, it's efficient. And if you know how to push yourself hard, it, it can be an efficient way to work out. Right. And like I said, and I'm going to keep saying this for anyone listening to it. I'm not, we're not saying necessarily that this is good or bad or different in terms of how to train. Right. Yes. Pushing to that level of intensity, A, it's a skill. It is a learned skill. You have to do this for a while, right? This is also why when people are like, these studies, oh, we took recreational trained lifters that had squat to failure. Yeah, bullshit. Show me. They, they gave up. They squatted till they, the discomfort outweighed their willingness to hurt. Pushing hard, I think there's a biology to it, but it is a learned skill. They talk about that endurance sports. The top cyclists, the top runners, they know how to suffer. Where most people would quit, they keep turning it over one foot after another. Chris Hoy, one of the top track cyclists in history, put himself into shock after one time trial attempt at altitude. Right. He put himself into shock and had to go on oxygen and then did it again the next day. Wow. He, had to, <laughs> he was known for doing uh, Wingate tests and he would fall off the bike, puke, really puke, not fake puke like Mike, and then get on the bike. And he had his ability to suffer, to push himself to the limit. And apparently he talked to Graham Obrey. Graham Obrey is a crazy person. I'm sure you don't give a shit about endurance sports, but I did that for many, many years. Graham Obrey but... was this crazy cyclist out of Scotland, Ireland. He built a bike using washing machine parts. No joke. The guy was, <laughs> the guy was nuts, right? The guy was absolutely nuts. But he also said, there's a thing in cycling called the hour, uh, the hour record. And on a 400 meter oval, you ride for an hour straight. Imagine going to your local high school track and running for an hour in a circle. And the goal is to see how, how far you can go. It's a distance thing. Yeah. And he created two, three new ways of riding, three new, but he went and rode it on a Saturday, right? This thing is the worst. Uh, Miguel Indurain, one of the greatest cyclists of all time, won five Tour de France's, said that the hour record took years off his life. That it is the hardest uh. thing he ever did. He won the Tour de France five times in a row. Hardest thing he ever did. Aubry went and raced it, rode it on a Saturday or Friday, didn't like his response results, did it again the next day. The man was crazy. 
And he was, he was diagnosed bipolar. Read his book. You can watch his mood swings and I speak yeah. from experience. And right. but he told Chris Hoy, he said, when you think you're at your limits, just try to turn the pedals over one more time because you're not. Try to get the next one tenth of one person. You've always got, and Chris would, Hoy would talk about in the kilo race about how he would start to be blacking out at the end of the race. So yeah, learning to push, it does take practice. Some people like it more than others, which is why I'm not saying one style of training is better than the other, necessarily. At a point in my life, I do want to be time efficient. I've been in maintenance for a couple of years. Yeah. I go into the gym, I want to be in and out in 15 minutes. Right. And doing a rest pod set is the way to do that for me. Is that how everyone should train? No, please listen to me, people. I'm not telling you how to train. Never been telling anybody how to train. But even my own workouts, my own generic bulking routine is like, yeah, you should start the first set about two to three reps in reserve. And by the fourth set, you'll probably be getting close to failure just because of accumulated fatigue, depending on your rest interval. My point was always, and will continue to be until you know what zero reps in reserve is, you don't know what two reps in reserve is. Nothing Mike has demonstrated shows what zero reps in reserve is by any definition, what any paper has shown, what his own company tells people about what happens to bar speed. And that's it. Those three points are the entirety of my argument. And everything he's, else he's brought up is nonsense. It's a dismissal. It's a smoke screen. It's a deflection. It's guru bullshit. And anyone, get in the like press, rep it out till it won't move anymore, send me the video and I'll time analyze it. You can take my challenge or you can make excuses, which are always easier, but just realize this is something, a story I told in one of my videos. So graduate school, briefly, didn't work out. And I had a professor, old school excess physiologist, just a hard ass, old school professor. I love the guy. And one day I disagreed with him about something, some enzyme that didn't matter. And he goes, okay, wait class once a week. He goes, look it up. We'll talk about it next week. Came back next week. And he said, so, to look it up. And I went, um, I forgot. And he just looks at me and goes, I guess you knew you were wrong. <laughs> and like I said, I love the guy. I mean, he nailed me to the wall because yeah, <laughs> if I thought I was right, I would have looked it up because I would have jumped at the opportunity to prove him wrong. All these evidence-based twits, if all these critics of me wanted me to shut up, I've told them how to do it. They would jump at the opportunity. And yet what do you get? Nothing but excuses, nothing but dismissals, nothing but deflections. You know why? It's because they know they're wrong. And anybody listening to this, if you think I'm wrong, send me the video. I'll put it you, up. And if you prove me wrong, I'll publicly admit I'm wrong. You mentioned earlier on the podcast that, you know, you said, like, they should be able to admit they're wrong. Um, so not on this topic specifically, but obviously at points in 25 years, there have been times where you've looked back and, and thought you or realized that you were wrong. I was sure. curious if you Absolutely. could state some of those times that you remember. Well, here, actually, here's just a good example, right? I was forced to eat crow, and that was fine. This was many, many, many years ago. And, well, okay, here's, here's one of absolutely no relevance. I, somebody was talking about Romanian deadlifts, and they were like, okay, I, I need to stand on a plate. Like, this is not even relevant. And, well, okay, let's, let's differentiate here. Are there places I've changed my mind about stuff? Absolutely. That's just intellectual honesty. New research comes out. I don't know if you want to talk about the P ratio kerfuffle if we have time. It's a little separate thing going on right now. And that's a place where I probably would not defend what I wrote a decade ago, which mm. shocking that something yeah. I wrote, you know, 10 to 15 years ago is no longer cutting edge. Like, yes, what a stunner. Um, and I was like, I've never seen a single person uh, who could RDL, who could get the plates to the floor. And somebody sent me a video and it was a female with really long arms. And I'm like, okay, well, I stand corrected. This is of no relevance. That's absolutely a stupid example. <laughs> um, another one that, which was probably more legitimate. So this was back when Ripto was a much bigger thing than he is now. Yeah. And he was talking about some lifter he had taken, young guy, and in a matter of weeks, he'd taken him to a four or five squat, but his deadlift was only like 315. And I was like, mm. I don't buy it. I've never seen someone who could full squat more than they deadlift. I don't believe he's doing a full squat. And I was sent the video. I was wrong. It was just that simple. Mm. But you know how he proved me wrong? With visual, factual evidence. 
That's all you need, guys. What happened to Ripto? He just kind of died out, I guess. Because I, of interest. I don't want to get into it. We can talk about when we're done. I actually did a consult, which I'm doing now, okay. with somebody who was really involved up, oh. in, up in Wichita Falls. I got really? a bunch of uh, insider stuff <laughs> Ooh, about starting right. strength gyms and stuff like that. But I, it was told to me in confidence, and so I'm not going to – I sure. think it's just training – goes through fads five by five had its time in the sun mm. i think that's just all i just think the training and, and it and there were other you know there was strong lifts and there was gqzl i don't know what it is i don't keep up with this stuff anymore I don't know what that one somebody is. had another model of it and i just yeah he kind of had his time in the sun and the internet has changed and sure. well, let's face it i'll be the first one to admit yeah my my web i haven't updated my website in months because i don't think websites matter anymore it's all about mm. YouTube presence and Instagram. And I'm too yeah. lazy to do YouTube video every day or twice a day in the case of some people. Yeah. I use Instagram to post uh, silly nonsense because I can't be bothered. And I think Rip, he's even older than I and it just, yeah. the world has changed. Yeah. And that's fine. Uh, I'm still, you know, I still sell books. I still got my forum and I do YouTube videos whenever I'm PO'd about something and that's pretty much it.